So it's been quite a York centric um, <laughs> session as things so kind of happen. But it's <laughs> just a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's been it, yeah, it, yeah, it's been quite north north of England and quite urban, I think. Yeah. So far our focus, hasn't it? And and, and certainly that those are the experiences with what we might call community heritage and community archaeology that I've personally been involved in. It's been fairly fairly urban and a little rural, but this one takes us very remote, I think. <laughs> Possibly, yeah, the most remote we could get, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and 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 it also into a, quite a different context to the, the the sorts of context we've been talking about. And it, um, I've, I've been really a lot of what the other papers have been talking about have been really familiar, you know, in terms of what what I've what I've come to know about the community heritage pro projects I've been involved with in, in the UK. But it the relationships between heritage archaeology. Um, and community engagement in this particular context uh, were really um, turned on their head because we, we found ourselves dealing with those um, relationships in a, in a post-disaster context. So we'll give you a little bit of an, an overview of our experiences um, and then see what kind of discussion we can uh, provoke from there. So the field of heritage studies continues a critical interrogation of what it means to conduct community research, and the political, ethical, and personal difficulties that such work often entails. Like heritage, the concept of community is one that has been with us for some time. And just as heritage has a tendency to settle into that role of something that is great, good, objectified, and rarefied, so too does community tend to speak of something convivial, gentle, and idealized. Observations by Elizabeth Crook point out that a community is defined and justified because of its heritage, and that heritage is fostered and sustained by the creation of community. Their relationship, it would seem, is both recursive and self-fulfilling. But Neil and Walters, for Neil and Walters, communities are highly contested and heterogeneous sites containing a range of socio-economic tensions, needs, socio-cultural exclusions and contradictions. They are fashioned by social and cultural experiences, and political aspirations. Importantly, they are inherently fragile and dissonant as communities are continually reconstructed, both consensuously and contentiously. Nowhere are these socio-political frictions more heightened and transformed <coughs> than in post-disaster landscapes. It is our experiences of the politics and ethics of working with heritage and post-disaster communities on a series of exhibition spaces or a heritage trail, if you like, that are the focus of our presentation today. Our observations about how to do post-disaster community heritage emerge from our experiences in Langtang, Bali, Nepal, and the destruction of the entire village of Langtang during the 2015 earthquake. Um, the color images, the uh, village prior to the earthquake and the black and white images, all that is left of that village uh, today, which is just one. Uh, uh, one three-story house there, the, the rest of the village is under, um, under the rubble there. A massive material descended on the village of Langtang um, during that earthquake, um, and it descended on the village so fast that there was no time for people to respond. Two-thirds of the village died. We ourselves were lucky to survive. Uh, we had been in the village up until that morning and decided to, um, we had we're brimming with ideas about the uh, heritage trail we'll, we'll talk a little bit to you about now, um, and decided to leave the valley a couple of hours earlier than we were intending to and um, were therefore uh, two hours away from the village when the earthquake uh, struck. Uh, but the disaster in Langtang is really only part of our relationship to that place. Since 2013, we've been walking the valley with community members recording stories about enchanted landscape features on these storytelling surveys. The politics of engaged heritage research in disaster contexts is gaining ever more traction as a mainstream Anthropocene subject. There's evidence to suggest that an increase in the number of nat natural disasters, include, including geological ones like earthquakes, are linked to climate change. Volatile regions of the world have become busy sites the local global actants jostling in the aftermath of disasters to survive, recover, 
rebuild and remember. In this context, we've become attuned to the imperfect ways that heritage management interfaces with disaster management. The latter has arisen from realist agendas, that is strategies for action triggered by managerial concerns, particularly how to map risk, measure vulnerability, and so forth. Problematically, much of this work tends to equate security and well-being with material resources. Even as, if this work is deemed successful, though, it only meets a portion of the community's recovery needs. More often, these atheoretical strategies smother community responses and latent structures of care that might otherwise become activated following disaster. They also ignore that security has its basis in sensation, not solely materiality. <coughs> So rather than repeat the insistence that post-disaster recovery should focus on erasing the original disaster event itself by regenerating with financial input, we join a new wave of scholars that are interested in the effective dimensions of heritage in disaster recovery. While the earthquake was devastating for the physical fabric of Lang Tang's heritage, the post-disaster landscape posed just as much of a threat to the intangible bonds of community and tradition. As Barrios notes, one explanation for this is that disaster recovery experts and political elites often render the emotions and attachments of subaltern disaster affected populations as obstacles to fiscal cost benefit analysis or techno scientific management. All too often, as Proben points out, in these circumstances, scholars may find themselves trying to help a community by inviting them to participate in something that they are not particularly interested in, nor does it make sense to their own well-being efforts. Our ambition to rethink post-disaster community heritage commenced when we observed the earliest efforts by the community to reconstruct what we might think of as its heritage monuments. Manny walls, the building of a temporary monastery, memorial flags for the lost loved ones, and so forth. Such work didn't require funds as such, but they were prioritized above the rebuilding of homes in most cases. For us, this observation really posed an important question about the role of heritage or ancient things, as uh, they refer to it in, in the valley, in recovery needs, particularly emotional needs. For the community, post-disaster recovery included re reorientating themselves in a home that had become and felt wholly insecure. Vulnerability was being measured, not just in a physical sense, but in a spiritual, magical, and karmic one. Whispered explanations for the tragedy posited more than human involvement. For example, pre-earthquake restoration work on the monastery that was destroyed by the avalanche perhaps had angered malevolent, malevolent beings. A sense that parts of the valley were eternally haunted, abounded, tensions mounted, hairline fractures in the community continued to rupture along centuries-old clan lineages, becoming entangled in much longer histories of perceived responsibility for the past, and simmering accusations about everything from mismanagement of money to dis disrespectful interactions with spiritual beings. Into this melting pot of local tension, Langtang also became a busy place for the, at least N eight, eight NGOs um, who were working on the project of recovery. International charities and government agencies somewhat erratically funneled money into food and essential life maintaining materials, then corrugated iron sheets for temporary housing and solar panels, and then more permanent housing resources. International tourists that had connected with the valley donated money often to particular individuals that had acted as guides or as homestay hosts. Though the sentiments of this assistance were well-meaning, when it became apparent that some were benefiting more um, than others, and in some cases actually profiting from the disaster, feelings of alienation ensued. This manifested in more formal NGO recovery efforts in a range of ways. Our work with members of the community affiliated with the National Park Authority um, was at times hindered by particular individuals from the valley that sought to obstruct the movement of, of project funds to what they saw as a rival family lineage. It was clear that simply enacting a participatory method was unfeasible here, and instead it was essential to practice a series of reflexive and imperfect negotiations that balanced devolved collaboration with the need to actually be effective in this context. 
one of the things we were very conscious of in the collaborate on, in the collaborative design of the Heritage Trail exhibitions was that memorializing such a traumatic event risked actually imprisoning the community in narratives that might entrench uh, a cyclical trauma. Instead, the memories and narratives that we were working with needed to offer the community a way out, um, a thread in the direction of hope or, or security. We sought to build comforting and hopeful, effective experiences into the Heritage Trail, um, which was an initiative that, that commenced in collaboration with the community. And we were inspired um, by small prayer huts that are distributed around the landscape of the valley. They're often located near sources of water and such huts house prayer wheels, which contain paper scrolls with the mantra on Mani Padmi Hum, which is written repeatedly on the scrolls. The effectiveness of these prayers for compassion relies on the movement of the wheel, which is powered by wooden paddles uh, submerged in the flowing streams. It's effectively a very old, sustainable technology engineered to generate spiritual en energy and good fortune. Taking this principle, we've harnessed the valley's hydropower to an iPad, um, onto which are recorded stories of the Sacred Valley and the earthquake um, told by members of the community. Of the many stories we've recorded, the Baal legend has become a really prominent one as a narrative of hope, offering a way to move beyond memorialising trauma. Baal are mystical refuges. Um, according to legend, an important Buddhist master called Gu Rinpoche concealed important valleys in the 8th century AD so that they could be used as sanctuaries in times of... Um, uh, when, when humanity was in need. These valleys are called Baal or hidden lands um, and they're remote and beautiful places where plants and animals have miraculous powers. Um, aging is slowed and um, enlightenment can be quickly attained if you, if you meditate in, in caves or places in these, in these valleys. Such mystical places, whilst they have a physical location, can only be experienced in their transcendental form by confronting and enduring hardship much like the purifying process of pilgrimage. So Langtang Valley, a place that has witnessed tremendous hardship, um, is considered by many Tibetan Buddhist practitioners to be on the list of places that are bail, um, the location of a very particular bail called Dagam Nango, which means heavenly moon of the half gate form. For many, trauma and grief still endures, and this is made for a very complicated research space and above all, a very emotional one. Much of our method is necessarily um, reactive diplomacy. Similarly, a politics of vulnerability has emerged that operates at higher resolution than the sort of tidy scale of community. Some portions of the village have lost everything and may never regain the same standard of living. Others, it would seem, have some, somehow increased their wealth and built additional houses in Kathmandu. The justice, or sometimes injustice, is confusing and often disheartening. A physically fractured valley often teeters on the brink of social fracture, and into that we tentatively steer our course. At some points it's required that we produce results much quicker than we might otherwise, simply to demonstrate our commitment and our trustworthiness. At such times, our impulse to enact a meticulous collaborative approach has been challenged because it would seem for the community at those times what they needed was someone um, they could trust, they could place their trust in for the, the trust in their own future. While such an arrangement of power doesn't sit well with a participatory ethic, during those moments we pondered whether it was, wasn't really the taking of power so much as a sharing of responsibility, and hopefully therefore an act of that same compassion which was shown to us whilst our friends helped us to safety during the earthquake. So, just a sort of summary of some of the ideas that we were confronted with um, and we, we kind of been pondering through as we do this research, um, which we thought might be kind of useful as, as discussion points um, for the, the, the sort of questions and discussions at the end. So basically, um, the ethics of participation for us have altered. It wasn't so much about practicing a method, a participatory method, but actually we've had to really, um, it's much more about sort of individual decision-making processes and, and, and really negotiating at the point of each individual decision-making as to who it's going to affect and, and how it will affect the overall project. Um, there's a huge amount of micropolitics in the community um, and a politics of vulnerability that operates at a number of different scales in the country. Um, we've had to really demonstrate rapidly various forms of commitment so that 
the basis of all the work that we, we're doing in the Valley is about um, building trust constantly because it, that trust is also simultaneously constantly eroding as well. Um, and yeah, so so as we said, a, a sort of taking of a taking of responsibility in some situations that might actually feel quite uncomfortable when you're trying to do participatory work, um, but because there is a sort of vacuum uh, in that all of the, the community bonds are very strained, all of the resources that the community might have otherwise been able to draw upon might be gone or, or might be sort of really, really strained also. So um, it's about balancing the short-term needs of the community work versus the long-term well-being. So yeah, that's, that's what we have to sort of... Quick. <laughs> summary of the discussion. An overly quick, that's... Um, introduction.